Hi, I'm Douglas Mason, President and CEO of Magnum Gold Corp Inc., MGI on the TSX Venture Exchange. A 2015 drill program on the LH property intersected high-grade gold, including 16.9 meters of 13.58 grams and 11 meters of 20.66 grams per ton gold. A follow-up drill program is planned to further evaluate previously identified subsurface high-grade gold mineralization. Please visit our website at magnumgoldcorp.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is James Corbett, publisher of the CorbettReport.com. He's also an editorial writer for the International Forecaster. He's speaking to us from Japan, where he has worked and lived since 2004. Welcome back to the show, James, and happy Valentine's Day. Indeed. Well, it's already 15 years, and so I think we've uh, crossed over that date, but thank you anyway. Do they celebrate Valentine's in Japan? They do, but it's kind of the reverse. Uh, in Japan, the girls give the boys chocolate, and uh, don't worry, there's another holiday called White Day on March 14th, where the boys then return the favor. China says now that they are a near-Arctic country and want a polar silk road. And any progress on that? Uh, well, I've heard chatter about that, but I don't know what uh, tangible, um, uh, actual progress has been made with regards to that. I know that the Arctic is now becoming more of a geopolitical area of interest um, uh, because of general trends in the area, and uh, they, uh, I know Canada and Russia certainly have been trying to assert their Arctic sovereignty a little bit more strongly in recent years, and even talked about uh, stationing more bases and things up in the, that area, but I, I haven't really heard about China's actual tangible plans for a polar silk road, so I guess we'll have to wait and see, see it to believe it. Are they developing more islands in the South China Sea so they can claim territory there? Uh, I don't know if that's an ongoing phenomenon, as in if they're still um, uh, creating new territory. But at any rate, they uh, they certainly the South China Sea still continues to be a contentious issue f uh, in the region generally, and the ASEAN nations have uh, certainly been continuing their claims against China, and uh, it's it's growing um, pressure on on that area, which of course is extremely important. Most important, I think, for China in terms of its shipping routes uh, from Africa and other locations. Uh, a lot of shipping goes through the South China Sea, so it's quite obvious why China is so interested in exerting um, sovereignty over the, the various parts of that area. How are the Asian stock markets reacting after last week's meltdown of the Dow? Well, uh, as you know, I think it was a global phenomenon that there was a, uh, a, a stock pullback. And I think that probably wasn't surprising um, that uh, the Asian markets would follow in the wake of the U.S. markets. But there are some other countervailing and interesting uh, trends taking off here, including the fact that uh, the Asian property real estate market has been booming in recent years, led by Singapore, but with uh, Hong Kong and and uh, some of the other nations here uh, not far behind. And a lot of this has to do, with again, with Chinese investors. But uh, but there there's just generally trends going on here that there's an increasing property boom going on real estate. So there's, there's that happening. And at the same time, in fact, we've just had uh, the Bank of Japan governor, uh, Haruhiko Kuroda, has just been sworn in or has just been uh, uh, nominated for a second term as the helm of the bank at the helm of the Bank of Japan he will be the first uh, Japanese central banker to last two terms uh, since the 1950s so this is actually kind of an, an interesting move and it does uh, you would think that portends uh, what we were talking about earlier where we, uh, a couple of weeks ago we were talking about uh, the Bank of Japan maybe sort of easing off on the gas pedal when it comes to their stimulus. But no, as a matter of fact, the team that he's assembling, there are people saying, uh, it looks like they're going to go for even more stimulus uh, at this time. So um, we'll have to see how that plays out, but there is a possibility that they're going to try to keep those good times rolling as much as, as long as possible. Is the Japanese economy showing surprising growth? It is. In fact, the latest uh, figures are that the uh, Japanese GDP has just grown 
for the eighth straight consecutive quarter, something it has not done in 28 years. So there is some sort of economic uh, boom or progress taking place right now. Uh, it remains to be seen whether this is all central bank engineered or whether they'll be able to take those training fields off. But at any rate, something is happening here. Uh, I don't think it's been translated into significantly higher wages or anything that will affect the retail economy at this point, but it is uh, certainly something happening. In Do the Japanese feel more optimistic about their economy? I think optimism is slowly returning. Uh, it will probably take a lot more than this to really get people on board uh, with any sort of actual boom or whatever is happening, uh, precisely because it has been decades of stagnation. So, again, well, I think it's a believe-it-when-we-see-it type of phenomenon. And there's the sort of Damocles hanging over the Japanese retail economy, where uh, I believe it is next year uh, they're scheduled to raise the consumption tax from 8% to 10%. And that's on top of the 5% to 8% raise that they did a couple of years ago. So uh, it's very likely that there would be a significant uh, drop in retail uh, sales if that were to take place. So uh, I think that's something that people are keeping their eye on. And the other part of this, of course, again, would be wages and whether th this uh, economic activity translates into something that's actually felt by the average worker, which I don't think it has significantly yet. Have the Winter Olympics helped reduce tensions in the area? Well, I guess that remains to be seen, but there are some hopeful signs. Uh, the fact, of course, that Kim Jong-un sent his sister to South Korea to actually be a personal envoy uh, to deliver a invitation for uh, South Korean President Moon Jae-in to visit uh, for a summit in North Korea. That's a pretty significant step. And a potentially, I mean, again, we have to see how it plays out, but potentially quite an incredible lessening of tension. And uh, the, I think the big question uh, at this point is not whether the South and North Korea can at least begin talks to start ironing out differences, but whether or not the U.S. is going to try to play a, a roadblock in that. Um, will they get in the way, essentially? And uh, I say this because uh, Gareth Porter just uh, did a uh, article at Truth Dig, Can South Korea's Leaders End Trump's North Korea's Crisis? Where basically he's saying this is a Korean thing and the Koreans might have a chance at actually uh, doing this. And, and uh, But, uh, you know, will the U.S. actually get in the way? And that was uh, retweeted with uh, positive commentary by the, uh, the DPRK's foreign minister, uh, Ri Yong-ho. So, um, so apparently... You know, people are really speculating about this. This could be a significant change in Korean, the Korean Peninsula. It just remains to be seen whether the U.S. and China and other uh, foreign powers, as it were, will keep their nose out of it or try to keep their nose into it. And from the reaction that I'm seeing in the, in the American media, uh, just browsing online, it seems that they're still trying to amp up the, uh, the tension and saying, despite the, the charm offensive, North Korea is still a, a, a pending threat to world peace. Yeah, it's interesting. American commentators on the Olympics are, are saying things like that. You don't hear that from the Canadians. They talk about what's going on in the game or the particular event. Well, Canadian media has always been, I think, a little bit more balanced and level-headed than the American counterparts. We'll have more with James Corbett right after the break. I'm Greg Johnston, CEO of Carl Data Solutions, an industrial Internet of Things company that provides big data solutions for monitoring critical infrastructure. Carl Data offers machine learning and predictive analytics features through our cloud-based applications to deliver key asset-saving operational insights from massive amounts of data. Carl Data trades on the CSE symbol CRL and the pink symbol CDTAF. For more details on Carl Data, please visit carlsolutions.com. I'm Bill McWilliam, president of Cascadero Copper, CCD on the TSX Venture Exchange. Cesium is one of the world's rarest metals with a growing industrial demand. Drilling is underway on our Tehran property in Argentina to prove up a cesium resource. Cascadero's patent-pending leach process has the potential to make Cascadero the lowest cost supplier of cesium in the world. Visit our website, cascadero.com, or phone us at 604-924-5504. Welcome back. We're speaking with James Corbett. James, Japan's coin check apparently is involved in an investigation involving a $530 million cryptocurrency heist. Do you know anything about that? 
Yes, well, uh, obviously this follows the 2014 heist from Mt. Gox, which was the largest Bitcoin exchange at the time, back in 2014, and uh, some $470 million of Bitcoin vanished from that exchange somehow or other. Uh, there was probably some sort of inside element to that, but I think they're still sorting all of that out. Uh, so this is the second time there's been a multi-hundred million dollar heist or vanishing of uh, cryptocurrencies in, at a Tokyo-based exchange. So obviously the Tokyo, uh, the Japanese government is taking this very seriously and they're investigating it and uh, there's there's investigations ongoing. But at the same time, Japanese Finance Minister Taro Aso has been positioning Japan to be the global cryptocurrency trading hub. And one of the significant steps in that was last year when Japan declared Bitcoin an illegal currency that can be used in the country, one of the first nations to really officially clear it at that level. Uh, so there, there is kind of this interesting tension going on right now, whether or not Japan is embracing cryptocurrency wholeheartedly or is about to crack down on it. And I think it really could go either way. Well, South Korea is vowing firm action on illegal uh, cryptocurrency trading, and uh, their country is obsessed with Bitcoin. Uh, that's correct. And uh, I, I think people also know that China is looking to crack down on on and offshore uh, platforms for trading cryptocurrencies, and there's been talk in other parts of re uh, the region here. So uh, there is definitely a, a kind of mania going on in Asia with regards to cryptocurrency, and it's kind of love-hate and even I think the regulators and government officials don't quite know which side of this they're on at this point. There's a lot of talk of cracking down, but I think there's also the recognition that this is a new phenomenon that really is taking off. It really does represent a change, and it's not the type of thing you can put the, the cork back on the bottle and get the genie in there. So I think there's just a, a giant question mark hanging over this, and I think that's reflected in things like the fact that Korea has gone through its Bitcoin bubble mania phase uh, at the same time as Korea is tr trying to crack down on, on cryptocurrency exchanges and things like this. So, uh, again, there's just a lot of uh, really contradictory uh, signals that are being given out right now. And I think it, you know, it's just a question of which side the coin is going to land on. <laughs> Very nice pun there. <laughs> GM is shutting down a plant in South Korea. Does that mean the South Korean auto industry is in danger? Uh, well, I... It, it could, but again, I think the, the shift that's happening globally um, means that this might not be a, it, it might not be the final nail in, in any sort of uh, Korean manufacturing sense because we are starting to see, obviously, the Chinese market coming online and even Chinese manufacturers amping up. And it is conceivable that uh, we would see more of a shift from uh, Western companies like GM towards new upstarts in Asia itself. So it's not necessarily the end of all manufacturing in Korea, but obviously it's quite a big hit at this moment. We'll have more with James Corbett right after this. Cypress Development Corp's flagship lithium project is located just east of Alba Marley's Silver Peak Mine in the heart of Clayton Valley, Nevada. A 12-hole exploration drill program for lithium-enriched claystone on Cypress's 100% controlled properties is now underway. Cypress Development Corp trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol CYP, the pink CYDVF, and on Frankfurt C1Z1. For more information, please visit our website, cypressdevelopmentcorp.com. Keep informed. Receive our weekly recap of thought-provoking articles, podcasts, and radio delivered to your inbox for free. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage, HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're chatting with James Corbett. James, the Chinese government is pledging that it will put in a an employment-first policy to create millions of jobs as it faces millions of unemployed people and brand new graduates from university. What change would that mean? Uh, a very good question. It just means more people uh, in one way or another on the government payroll or uh, in government thrall. Um, so it is, uh, it, uh, like all these plans, it's just political blather until it comes into reality. And when it does, it's generally not the way people envision it going. So we'll, we'll have to, again, we'll have to see what they actually plan to do um, uh, in terms of concrete action with regards to this. But uh, 
at the very least, we know that the Chinese government is very much interested in being a central part of the Chinese economy and everything that happens in it. So one would imagine they would not allow uh, unemployment to fester very long without at least seeming to do something about it uh, via government action. Now, as companies take advantage of tax breaks in the U.S., could more Chinese factories close? It's conceivable. Uh, certainly could happen. Uh, it, it's so much pins, uh, is pinned on that American-Chinese trading relationship and what's happening there that I think it is certainly conceivable that we'll start to see a, uh, a shift in Chinese manufacturing. But uh, as I say, I think that Chinese, uh, I'm sorry, Asian consumer demand it is changing, and I think that it is becoming more of a regional economy than it uh, than sort of the uh, transit transpacific economy. And if that trend continues, it is conceivable that we will see short term damage from some sort of uh, lessening of the American Chinese relationship and uh, and business arrangements. But in the end, I think that might just be replaced by regional uh, trade and. I think that's obviously what China has in mind with regards to its trillion-dollar Silk Road uh, economic project that it's engaged in right now. It, I think it envisions and foresees uh, a, more of a regional trading lock um, than necessarily one that hinges on that relationship with America. An Airbus drone or drones will start delivering parcels at the National University of Singapore soon. Does that mean that, <clears throat> excuse me, that drone policies in Asia are maybe perhaps a little more advanced than they are in North America? Well, uh, again, this is just a test program, and it's only at the, uh, the university campus. So I think this is the type of little test uh, thing that they do before they even think about rolling something out nationally. And it's perhaps akin to the idea of uh, Amazon drone delivery or whatever they're working on, which will probably, again, be tested very small scale and in very uh, parceled out test environments before it's ever rolled out nationally. But at any rate, um, I'm reading that a representative from the Civil Aviation Authority of Singapore said the eventual plan is to roll out the drone parcel delivery system across the city state so long as it's done in phases. So again, this could be the first step. And uh, you never know, it might be somewhere like Asia where there's somewhat m more uh, freedom to do these types of things. Uh, it might be the test case where, where we see this really rolled out uh, on a large scale for the first time. The University of British Columbia is currently home to the world's tallest wood building, 11 stories. It's nicknamed the Ply Scraper. But Tokyo apparently has plans to beat that by a lot. Do you know anything about the world's <laughs> tallest wooden building? I I only saw the headline, so I don't know the details about this. But yes, I have seen that apparently there is a seventy-story wooden skyscraper that they are planning to build. I have no idea, you know, what the logistics of that is and and uh, how that would fare. I only find that surprising because obviously wood uh, construction very much went out of favor in Japan after the war, uh, where obviously the fire bombings caused a lot of death, damage, and destruction that I think people here never wanted to see again. So almost every building and edifice here is concrete and or brick or really quite uh, quite dreary, actually, in terms of its architecture. So it would be very, very, very interesting and strange to see a wooden skyscraper in Tokyo, of all places. Well, I do recall after the deadly earthquake in Kobe that claimed thousands of lives, the safest part of the city and the one that survived the best was the so-called 5,000-person Canadian village where they use Canadian traditional building techniques, frames, and, and uh, nails. Interesting, especially because I don't think Canadian building is known for its earthquake safety. But at any rate, you never know. Yeah, these types of things uh, sometimes happen. And, of course, the other side of that is, uh, unfortunately, in Japan, the construction industry is run a lot by mafia and ex-police, um, and there's a lot of graft and and, uh, and chicanery that goes on that sometimes is exposed with regards to cutting corners with regards to safety. So uh, I think that might be another factor in the collapse of some of the buildings during the Kobe quake. James, anything else that's uh, come up lately that we should know about? I think we covered quite a bit of ground. Uh, so I don't know, uh, other than the fact that obviously I think what's happening with regards to the U.S. and the Federal Reserve is uh, clearly something that's still 
continuing to affect um, markets around the world and will continue to, I'm, I'm sure, in the coming weeks and months. So we'll definitely be keeping our eye on the U.S. stock markets and how things are faring uh, with regards to that. And uh, for the international forecaster this weekend, I'm going to be writing specifically about the new Federal Reserve chair and what we know about him and what, what his likely new policies are going to be uh, with, in contrast to what Janet Yellen was doing. So I, I hope people will check that out. James, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for having me. My guest has been James Corbett, publisher of the CorbettReport.com. He was speaking to us from Japan. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio. Find us on Twitter at TalkDigitalNet. Our popular YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. You can find us on Twitter at HowStreet. Any questions for the show can be sent to info at HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Thanks for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com, HowStreet.com radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.